And welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Slideshow Show, brought to you by CKCC Radio on YouTube. I am Chris O'Mealy, once again bringing you a slideshow, and I have a special guest with me today. You know him from the Real Paranormal Talk podcast, as well as Ranking Tracks on CKCC Radio. And did you also know he is a published author with six, that's right, six books available on Amazon right now. Please welcome to the show, Jeff Trelowitz. Hey, everybody. Glad to uh, be part of another show here on CKCC Radio, making my YouTube debut for you. YouTube for you. So... How the show works, Jeff, is I'm going to show you 20 pictures all related to something important to you or significant to you. And you're, you have no idea what I'm going to show you. No clue. So, so this should be interesting. So every one of your reactions will be genuine. I don't even know what the topic is, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm, I'm in the dark on this one. So knowing how much fun it is for you to be a paranormal investigator and how much I enjoy real paranormal talk, I've prepared a paranormal slideshow. Excellent. That's, that's what I was hoping for. So it's a little bit of mixture of all kinds of things that you've talked about before and maybe a couple of surprises thrown in there just for entertainment. We'll see. All right. But we've Sounds got 20 good. pictures prepared. Are you ready for your first slide? Let's do this. Here we go. Ah, uh, the original. Jason and Grant, the people who made paranormal on tv cool because yeah there were other shows before then there were sightings and other shows like that but there was nothing quite like the original ghost hunters i used to watch this show religiously like oh, I, I i yeah i mean and even now with the reboots they're on at the same time so jason has one show grant has one show they're on different networks and they're on the exact same time and i'm like really that's not cool. They're competing directly against each other. Yeah. So what I wound up doing was watching one week, like, because Ghost Nation is with Jason and Ghost Hunters is with Grant. So I would watch Ghost Hunters live, and then the next night I would watch Ghost Nation. The next week I would watch Ghost Nation live and then flip-flop just because for me it's not really fair. I enjoy both shows, so I didn't want to be like, oh, I'm only going to watch one. I always loved this show. I always had a good time with it. But at the same time, I also enjoyed on South Park when they parodied them. Oh, oh and the fact is both of them loved that episode. Yeah. I, I've seen quotes on it when they're like, that's when we knew we made it, when South Park was making fun of us. Yeah, that, that's like the, the famous quote from the musicians. I, I'm yep, trying with to Weird Al. Where yep. They're just like, this is how we know we're famous now. <laughs> Weird Al wants to parody us. Yep. That's how you know. Yeah, I will. I will always be a Jason and Grant guy no matter what. But the question is, which one do you prefer? <laughs> I don't think I actually have a preference, to be honest with you. I like both of them for different reasons. I like Grant because Jason's always kind of come off slightly dickish. And I I'm not <laughs> saying that in a bad way, but Grant has always been more down to earth. So if I had the choice of meeting one or the other, I would definitely want to meet Grant first. You know what? I'll, I'll agree to that. I think I would choose to meet Grant over Jason. He does seem like a much nicer fellow. Yeah. He, se he seems like a fine, upstanding citizen who uses his left and right turn indicators. <laughs> Not that Jason doesn't, I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. Uh, again, I like Jason. Like I said, I still watch Ghost Nation, and I enjoy him, And but out of the two. And I still want to know what caused the big feud between the two of them, that they both clearly, they play, they, they say there's no feud, but clearly there is. Well, maybe that'll just be another one of the unsolved mysteries. Yes. Are right, you ready for your next slide? Bring it. That is, yep. Got to have a good ghost hunting equipment uh, case like that. I, I see quite a few things that I actually have. EMF detectors and recorders. And uh, I don't actually see a K2 in there, which is surprising. But Well, I pulled this picture off of Amazon. It's supposed to be a starter kit. Okay. So so Makes I don't sense. I don't know how much of this you would consider starter equipment versus advanced equipment, but I just think it's fun that you can get the entire kit off of Amazon, and I think it was only like thirty something bucks too. That's that's not bad because like if you go to GhostStop.com and get their starter kit, it's like seventy. So, but I believe theirs actually does have a K two meter in it. So, well, would K two be the most expensive piece? 
Out of everything in here, yes. Okay. So what, because, what's your uh, what in your opinion is your most essential piece of equipment going into the field? What's like the one thing you gotta have? An audio recorder or a video recorder for me, because that's when you use the K two. It could be a lot of different things that cause the K two to go off. Right. With the video or an audio, some of that is even more specific. I mean, obviously, there's there's some things you can debunk from audio but for me the video or audio recorder is the most important thing in a ghost kit gotcha and i, and I, I do, would agree with I, that i do see that there is a video or an audio recorder i the looks like there's some motion detectors in there i can't tell what's still in the package though I, w without actually going to the description, I wouldn't be able to tell you either, but... But I, I do like the actual carrying case that it comes in. Mine is just in a random shoulder bag, so... <laughs> this, one's, this one's fancy. Yeah. Little briefcase there. Okay, ghost hunting equipment. Ah, uh, yes. A, a very famous picture. Still debated to this day if that is a... Uh, ghost there to the right of the organ it, it's kind of hard to tell because i mean obviously it, to me it's a it almost looks like emperor palpatine yeah a little <laughs> bit yeah so unless that's where he when he got thrown into the core reactor and that's where he wound up but it's still a, a great picture i like how the image is slightly transparent in certain areas and more transparent in others. Like the feet you can clearly see through, but the face is solid. Now, do you think that that's, there's any kind of science behind why a, an apparition would be more transparent in one area versus not the other? I, I For me, it goes into like... I don't know if it's necessarily science. I think it's more the way that possibly even the spirit wants to be seen. I mean, because you think about, like, the background is black. So, you know, it's hard to tell, for example, where the stairs are if it's actually, especially the, the top stair looks black anyway. So it's hard to tell how much of it is the spirit and how much is the the platform uh, that the organ is on. That's true, too, because also if you look at the face, the face is clearly in front of a dark part of the photograph, so it could be the same amount of transparency the whole way, and you, we just don't really notice it because yeah. of what the background's doing. That's a good point. And then you even look at the top bar, and, it, like, the ghost, like, there's no transparency there. You can't tell necessarily in that part if the ghost is in front of the bar or, or behind the bar. That's true, too. I, I would wager in front of just because of where I see the, 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 the shawl legs. or whatever it's yeah. it's wearing. Like, yeah. almost looks like it's draping off the stairs there. Yeah. But, yeah. I always I always really like this photograph, and I love all the, the attempts to debunk it and the fact that people are still unsure to yeah. this day. It's one of the most famous photos that has been taken that i've seen like you said i've seen people try to debunk it i've seen people try to confirm it and it's it's stuff like this that makes me even more peaked to do ghost hunting when there's so many people going no it's this no it's that well eventually we're going to find out the truth i mean imagine and if you took a photograph like this you'd be beside yourself that would be the most exciting day of your paranormal Hunting, really. Well, like, my friend took a picture that we still can't figure out if it, what it is. And we've even shown it to one of the ghost hunters that were on TV. And he's like, I have no idea what to tell you on this one. I know. That's, that's got to be a cool feeling. That Yeah. When Dustin was like, I don't know what I'm looking at. And, like, we've gone back to that spot to try to debunk it so many different ways. Going, okay, is it? possible that it's a uh, car light well we're actually raised up off the high or off the road next to us there's no way it's a car light there's no street light there's no other thing that could create a light 
there's clearly a figure here. There's clearly a light of some kind, but we don't know what it is. That's awesome. All right. Uh, one of my absolute favorite locations to go to. The St. Light, St. Augustine Lighthouse, just because a of the Ghost Hunter episode. That's how I first learned of this lighthouse. It is easily top five episodes of any paranormal show. Uh, having been there myself, I haven't actually investigated there, but I've had some moments there that I'm like, wait, what just happened? Because I had one, uh, and I've told this on my podcast, but it's still one of the funniest stories. There is a bell that is on the ground in front of the lighthouse. And I was there with a friend of mine, and I said, you know, if there's anybody here, please give us a sign of your presence. And I immediately heard the bell and my eyes just completely bugged out. And my friend goes, yeah, there's some kids over there. They kicked the bell. I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> just when you thought you finally yeah, like, got evidence. Yeah. Cause I, the, the sad thing was I didn't have any recorders going, so it wouldn't have mattered. It would have just been a personal experience, but it was just perfect timing. I'm like, give me a sign. Ding. Oh my God. Nope. <laughs> I've even like we were standing in front and it wasn't even a particularly windy day, but all of a sudden this wind gust just kicked up this pile of dirt, almost into the shape of a human being for like a second. And again, I was like, wait, did anyone else? No one else saw that. Damn it. So, you don't, you can't get any backup on that one. That's frustrating. Yeah. Again, I, cause I was in the middle of the day. I didn't think to bring any equipment. It was just to say I've been there. And I have climbed the steps and I've been on top and it is, first of all, it's a lovely view from all the way up there. Knowing the history of the lighthouse, the tragedy that have happened, the three little girls that died there. It's just, it's such a spooky location, yet it's so breathtaking to stand on top of it. So it's a good combination of the, yeah. the it, literally the light and the dark, you yeah. could almost say. And oh, yeah, without a doubt. and bringing it back to what you said about that Ghost Hunters episode, that might be my all-time favorite one, just because that was the closest they've ever gotten to real evidence was yeah. that lighthouse. Yeah, when when the they caught the figure leaning over, and then a second later, he's three stories higher. He was mocking I mean, them. That's what I yeah. always said. He was literally mocking them. Like it ran up the stairs, and then it looked back. Yeah, and the uh, new Ghost Hunters went back there. And it was only like for a half episode. And I'm like, no, that deserves a full episode return. Absolutely. Uh, they've done, cause they've done a lot. Cause like ghost hunters Academy, which was their reality show, did an episode there. Uh, and then the two episodes, but it, it's such a great location. I Absolutely loved, loved, I loved yeah. my visit there too. Yeah. I have yet to make it to Salem. Me and my friend keep saying that we're going to go and we just can't figure out a time and a, to head there because she's my ghost hunting buddy. We She's the one that actually caught the figure in the cemetery. Um, we'd love to go to Salem. We keep talking about it. So hopefully in the near future we get to go. But uh, some of the stories I've heard there. And I, I refuse to go during Halloween because that's too cliche. Well, yeah, it's probably also too crowded. Yeah, because like, like I did, I did St. Augustine on Halloween. Not again. It was I think we left on Halloween, but we were there that week, and it was just a weird feeling. Like you, you could tell commercialism was in the air. It was like no, it's not the same. <laughs> it's like the Charlie Brown Christmas special. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But yes, I've I've been once, and I absolutely loved it, and I would love to go back. But again, the history there, the fact that. You know, when you think witch trials, you automatically think Salem, yet they were not the first to do it. They didn't have the most, but there was just something about that moment that cemented Salem as the center of witchcraft in, you know, that time of the year. But it's a, it would be a great trip to take. Yeah. And uh, I, yeah, and I'm not that far from it. It's like a two or three hour trip. So, so it's totally doable for you, too. Yeah. It's not like, you know. If I was in Florida going, yeah, I want to go up to Salem for a day. Yeah. Well, that's not happening. No. 
especially now, but that's another story. Exactly. But yes. Well, when you make it there, we will, I'm sure you'll have a whole podcast episode oh, oh, dedicated definitely. to your trip. Maybe you'll you know, even, even record from there. Bring some. That's something I would definitely do would be, cause like I, and I've mentioned this, I did record an episode in the field. I just need to edit it. That's awesome. Lafayette Cemetery. It's uh, is this New Orleans? Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, I thought it sounded familiar. Again, just New Orleans to me. Uh, another place I have yet to visit, but I would absolutely love to. Just so much history to begin with, and then you think about the amount of deaths that have happened from natural disasters and diseases. And shitty people killing people. I yeah, mean, New Lafayette, Orleans has a checkered past, to say the yeah. least. Voodoo. I mean, there's a lot of things that would, to me, New Orleans would be the perfect storm of paranormal. I've because, seen I've seen Princess and the Frog and Live and Let Die. I know what goes. <laughs> <laughs> Both of those have a voodoo master as a villain. Yeah, and and you know if Disney's making a voodoo master. There's got to be something to it. So there's so much that could go wrong in an investigation in New Orleans. And that's why it's one of the top three haunted cities in the South, because of all the things that, could, that have happened in that city that have led to unfortunate passings. Like I've, I went once, we did the ghost tour, and while the tour itself wasn't anything super fun to write home about just because of the fact that you didn't actually go in mm -hmm. any places but hearing the story some of them were really were really freaky like the the hotel story that the the guy told us the couple was co had complained because somebody took pictures of them in the middle of the night on their camera and they didn't realize that till they got home and developed the film the problem was the pictures were taken from directly above the bed while they were sleeping that's not creepy at all i mean and of course, we're staying in like a hotel that was built in like the in like the 1900s, and our room didn't have any windows in it. It was one of those hotels that has like oh. a fully interior oh. room, giant fireplace, and like and everything creaks as you walk through. And I remember they all <laughs> they made us sleep with the TV on that night, which made me mad because the three people I was sharing a room with were scared, and I was just like, I just want to go to sleep. Yeah, I can like that would creep me out not not being able to see the outside world from your room, knowing what the hell could be in the room with you that you can't see. I kept looking in the mirror because, of course, the fireplace had a giant mirror on top of it too. Every Naturally. time I looked in, I'm like, I better not see anything looking back that I don't want to see. Nope. And it would be even worse, like if you could see the the mirror from the bed and you're like, Oh, you know, you roll over and all of a sudden you see something next to you. Nope. <laughs> and that's when I noped out. <laughs> Peace. Well, thank Done. Thankfully the room set up, the mirror was not facing the bed. So I'll at least give them credit for thinking that ahead. The one thing well, I remember I is the bathroom had one of those red heat lamps. So I turned it. I only turned on the red lamp the one time and I looked like Kane. Yeah, I, I I know at some point I have to get to New Orleans just to experience it. I There's so many things that I want to explore there. And yeah, because I've heard the stories of Lafayette Cemetery. It's one of the most haunted cemeteries in the country. So it'd be a great trip. Yep. Uh, so many different stories about Lincoln haunting the White House. That, you know, I, I, in fact, I did a whole podcast on it where imagine staying in the Lincoln bedroom and then hearing a knock on the bedroom door. You get up, you open the door and who's there looking at you? Abe Lincoln. I'd be all right with that. <laughs> I would. Too, I'd want to I'd want to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would freak me out for about a second, but then I'd be like, wait, honest Abe, you got to talk to me. You got to let me know what's going on. How's the afterlife, dude? Yeah, how's it going? And uh, yeah, that I mean, there's there's so many different stories of other people haunting the the White House. 
and they're not all necessarily famous people. You know, you think about all the different people that have worked in the White House throughout the history and just the spiritual energy that must be in that building. I've been to D.C. I did not do the tour when I, I mean, I probably was 10 or 12 years old. So I remember seeing the White House, but we didn't actually go in. We so did it. We did it. We did a Christmas time tour. I remember they had a really nice tree set up, and I remember everybody was really excited because there was like a family in one of the rooms that greeted us on our tour, but it wasn't the Clintons because I knew who the Clintons were, and I don't know who that family was that was in there. But like everybody, people buzzed about it. They're like, "Oh, I can't believe we saw them," and I'm like, "Well, I all I know is that wasn't the president." <laughs> Because that was during the Clinton administration, and there was it was a man, a woman, and two kids, and I think all the only daughter they had was Chelsea. Yeah, that's all they. Ha- yeah, that's all they had. So yeah, I have. So I don't know who I saw, but I mean, but again, you think about all the different people that would work in the White House on a daily basis. You know. Yeah. The, from... I I think my only issue with the Lincoln ghost is that Lincoln didn't die in the White House. Doesn't matter though. Ah, see, I've always been under that impression, and maybe that's something we have to talk about on a future podcast about uh, where these ghosts can end up. But I've always been under the impression you could only haunt the place you died. Nope. See, that makes uh, it uh, a lot uh, more uh, interesting I'll, to me. I'll just say something briefly on it, and then, yeah, we'll we'll talk about it later. One of the different theories is if you enjoyed the place while you were alive, you'll enjoy the place while you're dead. Okay. Oh, great. So my coworker who keeps threatening to haunt us when he dies is going to actually do it. Fantastic. (laughs) You're welcome. Fantastic. Great. (laughs) Anyway, anybody hiring out there? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) All right. Yep. Again, when you are so enthralled with a place that you request to have your ashes spread there... (laughs) No matter how creepy that is for everybody else, because newsflash, you're dead. It doesn't matter where your ashes are. And please don't do that because they're going to just vacuum you up. Yeah. Do you really want to spend, do you want to wind up going from an urn to a Hoover? (laughs) I wouldn't. Or a Kirby. Could be worse. Yeah. And do you want your family to know, oh, we did this and then they got, because you know Disney's not going to be like, no, we'll just leave it. It adds to the atmosphere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But how and great I, How great is the ride, though? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of my top favorite rides in all the parks. And me being me, I'm always on the lookout for something that should not be there. So I just want to clarify to anybody who's listening to or watching this, I should say, because... In case you're not familiar, that's the Orlando version of the Haunted Mansion at Disney World. And it's a very popular thing for people to have their ashes spread there. And what we're saying right now is please don't do it. Because they literally vacuum you up at the end of the day. So grandma grandma got to be as well. I think it I think you're right. I think it is. So just don't just don't do it. But please go on the ride. Yeah. Take your loved one on the ride. Keep them in their urn at all times. Please. Yeah. Keep your hands, arms, and ashes inside the vehicle at all times. We're not asking for much. Because trust me, they're not going to be number 1,000. Nope. (laughs) No, they're just, uh, yeah. So, But yes, uh, I wanted to throw that in there as a little Disney reference for you. Hell yeah. Because of course, Jeff and I work there together. So not, not here, but Disney. Haunted Mansion. Oh. I mean, the man was, he was the definition of macabre. I mean, there's (laughs) no other way to describe it. It's so true, yeah. When you think Edgar Allan Poe, the first word is nevermore. And then the second word that you should use is macabre. Yeah. I mean, you you just think about, like, think about how twisted Stephen King is and then know... Poe was 10 times worse. You know, I actually considered putting a picture of Stephen King in here, but I went with Poe instead. (laughs) Oh, no, I'm glad you did. But because 
uh, again, I, I like Poe. I like Poe's writing, but the dude was creepy AF. <laughs> but he's he's one of the premier ghostwriters of all time. And yeah. His stories are legendary now. I mean, again, you think of the t- Telltale Heart and you think of the Raven and just so many different things that you're just like, what was that man on and can I use some? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. But... To unlock that level of creepy in your mind, you know something had to happen to him. <laughs> now, have you used anything in his writing for your own inspiration and yours? I have not because, uh, again, my like my paranormal writing tends to vary much differently than what his was. So I don't try to use any other person's inspiration as my own because I don't want it to come off as, you know, a Poe ripoff. That's fair. I want, I, I want mine to stand alone, but I can still a- admire the work of some of the the greats that have come before me because i know in in no way shape or form is my name ever going to be you know synonymous with the writings of poe or king or dean Koontz. there are a lot of great horror writers and you know i haven't done anything that i would consider horror i'm you know i still think about some things i could do I mean, at one point I was going to do a parody series of a uh, kind of like a Friday the 13th, but instead of at a camp, at a old age retirement home. Oh, my God. I would read that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. And I have experience in an old age retirement home. I worked in one for several years. And I just kept having this image of an old person on a scooter trying to get away from a Jason type who walk slow to begin with but because the scooter is slow it was an even race that might be the first time jason might have had the advantage (laughs) yeah that that's been an idea that's been kicking in my head for years and i'm like just thinking about like the staff going oh you know this person died again you know this person died we've had 10 deaths in the last two days what's going on dear and then realizing it's not of natural causes well, all right, guys, listen up. If you want Jeff to write this book, please drop in the comments. <laughs> Maybe he'll, uh, that'll be yeah. the next one available on Amazon. <laughs> Just like all his other fine books, by the way. Uh, oh, see, I still watch, this is one of those shows I can watch, and I, I not only can, I, I do. I love Factor Fate. I do, too. The few episodes that I've seen of it, I've really enjoyed. No, I have the entire series on iTunes. So, That's awesome. And I love, you know, they've brought in guests. Kofi Kingston has been on the show. That's right. That's right. I remember that. Yeah, uh, he helped rebuild a uh, Stonehenge episode. They did a Stonehenge episode to see if it could be done using the tools of the time that they had. That's uh, yeah. They're, the whole concept of the show is brilliant. They. They break it down, and then they actually go out and do it. They have six experts in six different fields. So you've got Ben, who's the one who's got his back to us. He's a former FBI agent. You have Jael, who is looking at him, is a photographer. Uh, uh, she was a journalist. Uh, I forget what her specialty was, the girl next. Uh, Austin was the stunt guy. Yeah, I remember that. Yep, he was always the one that had to do the weirdest shit. Like, he would be the one that, (laughs) oh, we're doing a Bigfoot episode. We got to put you in a ghillie suit and run. (laughs) There was one episode where they were uh, looking into this guy that could do, could run in sub ice cold weather. So they're like, yeah, we're going to have you and Ben run on an uh, ice rink in just shorts to see how long you can go. Austin also had to then sit in an ice bath. His entire temperature dropped. I think they said like 15 degrees. They met with the guy. His temperature did not change. Uh, The guy in the far corner, I always forget what his specialty was, but he was kind of the, uh, he tended to be more of the skeptic. And then the guy with the glasses, he was only in half the episodes. Uh, That's Devin. And he, like, because 
him and then the girl in the middle flipped and there were two other people that they brought in. So, and just this show, the whole premise was they would watch clips. Each one would bring a clip. Then they would vote which one that they wanted to try to react, to recreate, to see if it could be faked or if it, what they were captured was fact. And I absolutely love the show. I'm sad it only lasted two seasons. Yeah, me too. Yeah, if you guys haven't seen it, check it out. It's very good. <laughs> who are you gonna call i mean i am so looking forward to the new movie whenever it comes out um there to me this is one of the top 10 greatest movies of all time the original and i do like I, i'm sorry i know people hate the second one i don't mind ghostbusters 2 i have not watched the reboot that came out i i own it i just haven't had a chance to sit down and watch it but Ackroyd, Murray, Ramis, and Hudson. I mean, the chemistry that they all had, then you throw in Sigourney Weaver, then you throw in Rick Moranis. Knowing how much Dan Ackroyd believes in the paranormal, his his father and his grandfather were paranormal investigators. So he grew up in the paranormal field. So what you see in these movies, there are some fact to it. But they make it look so much fun. Yeah. And Bill Murray, this is Bill Murray at his Murray-esque. You I know, mean, it's one of those movies that I loved it as a kid because of what it was. But as an adult, I appreciate it even more because I start understanding more of the subtle humor that Bill Murray threw in. Yeah. And you realize that Ray and Egon are probably slightly just off in the head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And then the best part is when Winston says this job is not worth 11k a year and I just start laughing. I'm like, "Man, that's even for 1984, that's not very good pay." No. When you're basically putting your life on the line and you don't know what's around each corner, yeah, 11k is not worth it. <laughs> I mean, I would do it just because it's the paranormal, but I know it's not for everybody. It's so good, though. Movie's great. And the second one is not as bad as people think it is. Exactly. Is it great? No. No. Does it borrow heavily from the first one? Yeah, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, because think about almost every sequel does that. Think about every sequel that you know. 95% of them borrow from the original. Because they have to. I mean, it's not as blatant as, say, Back to the Future 2 and 3, which is basically the same movie as 1. Yeah, But again, I absolutely love Back to the Future 2 and 3. I don't care that it's the same movie, just changing settings. Yeah, me neither. I don't. It's, uh, Ghostbusters is fun. And I think the remake gets a lot more hatred than it deserves. I still think it's good in its own way. There are a lot of moments where they do the whole, like, yes, we're throwing in this joke because we're Fan women. service. Yeah, that... because it's it's women power and everything. But honestly, between Chris Hemsworth and Kate McKinnon, it's definitely worth a watch. And they're, yeah, they're the show stealers. Because that's what I heard, that this was the first time, you know, Hemsworth did anything comedy related. And because, you know, you think about him, all we'd really known of him was Thor. He's so brilliant in it. That's what I've heard, that he comes off, you know, stuffy at times and then there are moments that you just fall over laughing and the best and part he, is he's such a dumbass and his name is kevin and that <laughs> makes me laugh so hard because then he went on and did vacate the the reboot of vacation and i think it led to you know thor ragnarok changing direction from the other ones because people saw how funny he truly could be yes yeah, so you can actually thank them for that but yes nothing will ever beat the original no him right here and also one of the most quotable movies of all time ray the next time somebody asks if you're a god the answer is yes i could yeah i could just drop quotes all the time cats and dogs living together <laughs> <Matt's hysteria. laughs> yeah william atherton was it is such a great 80s asshole <laughs> if you needed an adult to be your villain in the 80s and you did not go to william atherton 
you messed up. This man has no dick. <laughs> Brilliant movie. One of my all-time favorites. I also came out the year I was born, so I have a special connection with it. Nice. I think everybody has, like, that movie that came out the year they were born that they're like, that you're just like, yes, this came out the same time I did. <laughs> so I love it. A New Hope. There you go. It's right there. That's because I, I, I know sure as hell it wasn't Annie Hall you were going to say. Oh, God, I hated that movie. <laughs> yeah, but it beat Star Wars for Best Picture. Because yeah, well, of course it did. Of course it did. But I, I recently sat about two years ago, did this watch where I'm like, all right, I'm going to watch some movies that I should have watched already. And I'm like, all right, Annie Hall. What the fuck is this movie about? Yeah, it's basically just Woody Allen being his Woody Allenist. There's only for me, and I know we're off topic now, and I do not care. To me, there's one good Woody Allen movie, and that's it. Midnight in Paris, because it's it's creepy. It's got so many cameos in it. Like Tom Hiddleston is in a Woody Allen movie. There you go. Never seen it, but I'll check that out. Uh, but, do you know the premise of it? Uh, I do not. Owen Wilson is keeps going back in time in Paris because he's there with uh, crap. What's her name? The girl from uh, Wedding Crashers. Oh, geez, yeah, yeah. They're they're a married couple, and they keep he goes out for walks and always winds up time traveling to different parts of Paris. And encountering famous people and like he's freaking out. Rachel McAdams. Right, yeah, Rachel McAdams. So Tom Hiddleston hold on. I I, I gotta read you the cast because it's an absolutely I just um, pulled the cast up and I'm already like, oh, hold on. Yeah, I need to see this. Because <laughs> there's yeah. Kurt Fuller, there's Michael Sheen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. I, I might have to I might have to watch this. It's not your typical Woody Allen movie, which is what I absolutely loved about it. Because, again, I'm not a fan of Woody Allen, not just of the man or of the filmmaker. But there was just something about this that I'm like, holy crap, this movie is awesome. Adrian Brody is Dali. I mean, it's. Yeah, I think even except for maybe like Yui Bull, I think every bad director I, has. Yeah. And I believe this movie. is actually on Netflix right now. I will check that out. All right, yeah. Well, guys, Jeff and I are movie buffs too, so like you can excuse the the rant here. But the but Deal if you if you've ever listened to any of our podcasts, this is common, especially if I'm around. So yes, uh, apparently it's not on Netflix anymore. It used to be. All right. Uh, if there was ever a person I wanted to take out for a beer, <laughs> it's Josh Gates. Josh Gates is the man. I mean, between his two big shows of Destination Truth and Expedition Unknown, the man has, I want to see the man's passport. Between him and Phil from The Amazing Race, if they ever met and compared passports, it would be an amazing experience. He has to be close to getting, he's got to have like three-fourths of the world's countries visited. Oh, I, I, I think it's even more than that, because... You look at some of the earlier episodes of Destination Truth and some of the completely remote places that they've been. That's another show. In fact, I, I was watching episodes just last night of old Expedition or Destination Truth episodes of some of the places that he's been. And if you've never seen Josh Gates, I don't care if you're a history buff or a paranormal buff. He, because those were are his two shows basically, and the man is so sarcastically dry, it is absolutely <laughs> hysterical. Some of the like one liners is just like, and this is how I'm gonna die. <laughs> Any, I, I would I would wager that in the entire world of paranormal based celebrities, I guess you could call them, he's definitely my favorite. Oh yeah, it, uh, you know we were talking earlier about how. Grant is now. I will meet Josh Gates. I I would be the man's next door neighbor if I could. 
just because he's probably have a lot of cool shit in his house too. Yeah, yeah, because he's a collector. He he's basically the modern Indiana Jones. He was so deep in the Ugandan jungles. I'm surprised he didn't find Kamala. <laughs> I mean, again, you want to talk about places that are so remote? He's been to Chernobyl. I know. He did a Destination Truth episode in Chernobyl, which is so creepy. He's been to Island of the Dolls, which still freaks me the fuck out. Yeah. No, that, that's I, I, I don't nope. know that I could do Island of the Dolls. That's a nope for me. Yeah. Just because the different shows that I've seen from that place creeps me out. And I don't know if you know this or not. So obviously his shows are not going now. So what he's doing, he's turned into a talk show host. He does uh, Skype interviews with celebrities. That's awesome. I and so a, a couple weeks ago, and they're usually themed episodes. So he did a 80s episode. It was Sean Astin, Alex Winter. Oh, my God. Leah Thompson. <laughs> And then a uh, karate sensei who was teaching him the moves of the karate kid. That's amazing. And so, obviously, with Aston and Thompson, he basically ran down their entire film careers. It wasn't just, let me talk about this one thing. Alex Winter, it's a little bit different. Yes, they did talk about, because he's also a documentary film director now. But obviously, when you think Alex Winter... Only two movies, now three, come to mind. Yeah, that's true, but... But, like, with Sean Astin, he's like, let's talk about Goonies, let's talk about Lord of the Rings, let's talk about Stranger Things, let's, like, because there's so 50 many 51st different... Dates. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, that did not come up. I would have loved to have heard... I know, I loved, I loved him in 51st Dates, though. <laughs> well, now we know why Doug wets his bed. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, Josh Gates is so funny and you know like i said i just i would love to just he he lives in new york now he's a boston guy and some of the episodes are absolutely hysterical um the new show the Des uh, expedition unknown covers more historical things and they've spun off of that where he now has it's expedition x which is a paranormal show which he hosts but he sends two other people out to do investigate. <laughs> nice. Uh, look, it's it's uh, the guy from Factor Fate in a suit. <laughs> Growing up, I learned all about cryptids from my godfather. He's the man solely responsible for my love of the paranormal. I remember I would go to his house. Like, we would see him a couple times a year. And he would always pull me aside and be like, so uh, do you know anything about Bigfoot? And I was like 15, 16 at the time, and I had no idea what he was talking about. So he would show me these pictures from a book he had. He's like, there's this giant ape-like creature named Bigfoot in the Northwest. And so it, it's because of my Uncle Charlie that I am the man. But yeah, I, I, I would love to say Bigfoot is real. I would love to say I've seen a Bigfoot. I have not. And so there's a lot of uh, debate. Now, where do you lay on the, on? Um, do you believe in Bigfoot? Well, it's going to be an interesting little segue here. Uh, this one, no. But I'm a, okay. little, I'm a little more apt to believe that the Yeti could be real. Yeah. And again, going back to uh, Josh Gates on it was a season, it was the opening episode of season two. He, I believe he was in Nepal doing a big, a, a Yeti sighting. They found a giant footprint that they made a cast of. Uh, their local guide tipped off the media in the country. And so by the time they got back to their hotel, they got swarmed by media trying to get a look at this foot that they that they had found. I think I remember that one. Again, it's one of the ones I just recently watched. I, I watched it this week just because it's because you, one of the biggest things people always say about these shows is, well, they never find it. That's not the point. It's the experience and the, the fact that you never know what 
they could come across. But in this episode, they clearly caught a four foot f- footprint that was not like anything else that they had ever seen. So, I, I, I honestly, I there's very little I don't believe in at this point because I think that in the world of the paranormal, the sky is the limit. And in, in the depth as well. Because again, my Uncle Charlie, one of the things not me is monster. And, you know, when you were a kid, you hear the word monster and you automatically you know, freak out. And then you realize this creature's never hurt anybody. And this is the most famous image that has ever been caught of what could be Nessie. I, I'm apt to believe that Nessie's a possibility, but the whole thing I've always struggled with with ancient creatures living this long is that, A, their lifespan are not millions of years, so there has to be more of them that are procreating. Mm-hmm. And that's the big thing I've always struggled with when it comes to, like, ancient stuff like this. Now, I'm pretty sure that this is a piece of driftwood in this specific photo. And I've always felt like this has to be debunked because the waves on the water, I think, are too big to be compared to the size of the creature. If it was if it was an actual dinosaur, the waves would be much smaller because of the size difference here. Unless that's just a really tiny thing. But we also don't know how far down the creature goes. Think about if this was driftwood, would there be that much waves around it? Yeah, and that's true too. There's a lot there's a lot you can argue here. Yeah. But you know, thing- I'm not automatically saying, oh, this is definitely a picture of Nessie, but I like to look at it from all angles. Okay, so there are waves around it. What could have possibly created those waves? And my thing is, I have a tendency to believe people when a lot of people are reporting the same thing. They've all seen it. They're all saying the same thing, the same description. Even if you can't explain it, it's not like something happened and they all got together and were like, let's pretend Mm -hmm. that this is a thing. So... I have a tendency to believe that there is more out there. And the fact that we, everybody's like, well, you know, there are, there's high def cameras and people aren't capturing this stuff anymore. What does that tell you? And I said, what that tells me is that this stuff got smarter. Yep. We okay. got smarter and the creature got smarter. I mean, just look at a, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. The, uh, the bears problem that we had in the County where I grew up in New Jersey, the bears started adapting to being around the humans and not only did they actually stop bothering the humans as much well as far as like a danger factor was concerned they still be- they became a greater nuisance but there was an adaption there yep. and i remember the my father built a literal a literal shed on the side of the house to keep the garbage cans in and the bear figured out how to get in yeah so you're telling, you know, all creatures have some semblance of intelligence. I mean, my cat knows the sound of my car. Yep. And knows it's specifically my car. He knows my Toyota Corolla versus every other car in the parking lot of my complex. Yeah. They, they've they heard the sound so much of a particular door closing or even brakes. You know, obviously some cars you can hear braking. Mm-hmm. The cat can easily has heard that sound so many times. And then seconds later, you walk through the door. They know what that sound now means. Right. And I'll even I'll go back a slide here. What's to say that an ape like creature didn't develop some semblance of intelligence? I mean, look at what you can teach gorillas, what you can teach chimpanzees. Yep. And then the, the, then the other big argument is why these creatures are not real is, well, how come we haven't found more of them? When you think about how big the Earth is, and I I don't know the exact number, but we've only, like, explored maybe 4% of it. There's still an entire ocean floor we haven't explored. Exactly. Because it's it's just too deep, and and stuff lives down there. We've seen it. We've got pictures of it. You know, new, new creatures are being discovered every single day. 
How many new yeah, species probably... of insects do they discover in the Amazon every yep. year? And so. I was going to say, yeah, sure, they're smaller creatures, but that doesn't mean that there aren't larger ones for us to discover. And there's always been these stories of these fish that they thought were extinct for so long, and then they find they find them just swimming about. Yeah. So there, there always is a possibility. And I know size can be a factor, but look at the giant squid off the coast of Japan. They're, they're humongous, and they were so elusive. They were thought to be mythological for a long time. Yeah, most Hell, I'll even they were cracking. I'll throw it. I'll throw a Disney reference in here. The okapi was such a reclusive animal; it wasn't discovered till 1901. Yep. Do you know how recent that is in discovery timelines? <laughs> like, yeah, for for an actual mammal. So, yeah, there's there's more out there. I think whether or not you believe this is actually a picture of Nessie or not, I think there's always going to be more that meets the eye, and you should always have an open mind about this stuff. Yep. One thousand percent agree. <laughs> oh, 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 the Jersey Devil! I oh, had I to. Love, oh, I, I don't blame you. I I own a T-shirt that says "The Jersey Devil is my home." <laughs> well, because, we both we both live there. Yep. I actually I, grew up there, I, and I lived there for two years. I got married just outside the Barrens. So, in, to to bring it back to the uh, to the ex- Destination Truth episode that josh was looking for the jersey devil he was in the place that i got married at that's awesome it was the same building that i bought my t-shirt that's awesome you know you think about again that to me the jersey devil is the greatest american mythological creature because again there are bigfoot type creatures all across the world there is no story in any other part of the world similar to what the Jersey Devil story is. I, I think the closest thing you can even come to it would be like the Chupacabra, right? Yeah. That's like the closest possible thing. And even that's but, not the Jersey Devil. That's just a goat mutilator. Yeah, because the Chupacabra is a species of creature. You don't hear that there's multiple Jersey Devils. No, there's one there's Jersey one. Devil. There's one. <laughs> there are multiple Chupacabras. So yeah. it's not even remotely which makes it even more scarier. But all I know is I'm looking at that money at the bottom, and I'm just like, I could use some of that. So I'm, I'm game to go hunting. He's up devil. for a trip to the Pine Barrens, although we might find uh, Paulie and Christopher out there before <laughs> going through the Pine Barrens. Nice Sopranos reference. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I've been on the verge of saying times the truth is out there. <laughs> well, go ahead and say it, because... The truth is out there. I mean, and again, the newest paranormal show is called The Osbournes Want to Believe. There, There is a new show out there now because most people don't know this, but Jack Osborne is a paranormal investigator now. Which is he's pretty He's been cool. on several different shows. So he's got a show now where he shows Ozzy and Darren clips of the paranormal to get their reaction. That's got to be comedic gold they just started last week it is absolutely hysterical because ozzy is incoherent most of the time like they have to actually give him subtitles and sharon just completely like rambles on about things that does not make any sense and then turns out she was wrong about what she was saying (laughs) because at one at one point they were talking about something and she goes uh like tom cruise in that plane movie and they're like, what? movie? And then she actually meant Tom Hanks. <laughs> See, I heard Tom Cruise in Plane Movie, and I was thinking Top Gun? <laughs> yeah, no. She meant the movie where he played Sully. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not even close, but all right. You know, so, I was never a big reality show guy, but I got to say, The Osbournes was a guilty pleasure. My parents watched that all the time, and it was freaking hysterical. Jack was probably uh, the most normal one in the house. Yeah. Oh, you mean it wasn't Kelly? <laughs> but uh. yeah, so so I've never been a big X-Files fan because, I, I don't know, it was just something about the show. I never, And I'm glad because everything I've heard, Duchovny's a dick. So, but I like what it stood for. I like that it was trying to get the paranormal out there. You know, and now, you know, you because... 
shows like this led to shows like Supernatural, where it was, you know, a reality based paranormal show with believable characters. And in the case of Supernatural, sarcastic a holes. Exactly. My only my only real problem with the X Files was that it got so convoluted that I lost interest in it because it was one of those shows where it was like they they asked too many questions and didn't answer anything and it got frustrating. Yeah, and then once the Coveney left, it would it just went downhill. Yeah, because they spent so many years building up this relationship to will they won't they, and then they're like, oh, here's Robert Patrick's character now. And it's yeah. a completely different dynamic, was, and you're not going to care. This wasn't Jim and Pam. It didn't no. work. It wasn't Ross and Rachel. It just... It wasn't it Leslie wasn't, and Ben. wasn't Sam and Diane. Yeah, we could do a whole thing on that, but yeah. Yep. But I did appreciate it for what it was. Again, one of my favorite Josh moments is him going... He did a uh, on Expedition Unknown they did a four part series of uh, life uh, of searching for extraterrestrials. And he's actually been to Roswell and uh, factor fake did a Roswell episode as well. So, I mean, again, there's so many things that you can believe, you know, I don't necessarily believe everything that I'm told, but when I'm, when they're like, Oh, it was a weather balloon. Bullshit. Yeah, I don't think I believe that part. <laughs> no. Obviously, there's something there that the, the government did not want us to know. And every time there was ever something that came up, it was weather balloon. Because it's the easiest story that they could tell. Obviously, something Roswell. crashed in Roswell. Yeah, I, again, I would love to go there and experience it. I know it's very tacky because I've got friends who've been there and they've taken pictures. And like the McDonald's is a giant UFO. But still, I'd like to, I'd like to go just to just to be there. I've only been to New Mexico once when I did my uh, scout camping trip, and much different experience because we were in the mountains the whole time in Philmont, New Mexico, which was a fantastic trip. But the little town we were in was called Cimarron, and that was my first experience with like those real like really tiny Midwest towns. Mm-hmm. It was literally a three street town had a yep. census population of four hundred. <laughs> you yep. know, it was one of those towns. And Roswell was never a big town. That's the thing. It only became a tourist attraction because of the story surrounding it. And yes, is Roswell a tacky place to visit? Yes. Like you said, the McDonald's is a UFO. But is it really any different than, say, Salem? Orlando? Well, I was going to say Orlando and Mickey. No, it's very tacky, but it's still fun. Yeah, exactly. Salem's it's... very tacky, but I still love it. Exactly. It does not take away from the history of the place. Is it cheesy? Yes. But it, that could also add to the mystique of it. I give them credit for capitalizing on it because that just means they're going to get more money. Exactly. Because if they didn't, and we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. No, of course not. Is that the Battle of Los Angeles? Sure is. Yep. Uh, again, a great factor faked episode where they try to recreate this. And, you know, you could say, oh, because there's obviously something that is in the in the middle of all those lights. Is it all the lights just coming together or is there an actual craft of some kind? Because, again, the argument that the government gave us was weather balloon. <laughs> Eventually, that excuse has got to run out. I mean, how many times could you use it? Apparently, we have a lot of weather balloons. That just randomly crash down on Earth. Yeah. Which means that the weather balloon is a failure of an experiment. We shouldn't have them anymore if they all crash. Yep. And again, because I I did this on a recent uh, Real Paranormal Talk. And by the way, yeah, everybody check that episode out. That was one of my favorite episodes that you did because I didn't really have a lot of knowledge of the Battle of Los Angeles. If you guys want to get a really cool history lesson, uh, go to our CKCC radio page and check out that real paranormal talk, the Battle of L.A. It's a very fascinating episode. And because, like, I didn't know anything about it until the fact of the episode. And so think about this happened months after Pearl Harbor. So our country was already on edge. 
that another and we were getting word of another possible attack and all of a sudden this happens on american soil i'm not going to try to downplay it happening on you know and a Hawaii island, because that is still part of our country. But to have something like this happen on our mainland, thinking we were under attack, spooked a lot of people out. And when you think they fired hundred, thousand, hundreds and thousands of rounds of whatever it was, and it did not destroy the object, again, that's not a weather balloon. No. But yeah, check that episode out, guys, if you guys want to learn more about this. Very fascinating stuff. Uh, and again, another perfect example of I tend to believe what everyone saw. Yeah. They all saw something. that The whole city didn't just get together one night and were like, hey, let's all see this thing together and blow up the media. That, I, yeah. In 1942, that wasn't happening. And how how long would, would, did this happen after the... Uh, the uh, the Orson Welles scare, the War of the Worlds scare, because that was in the 30s, right? Yeah. So, like, and I know some people are going to say, like, well, it's just people being paranoid after that. I'm like, no, 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 that wasn't a radio broadcast. They saw something. Yeah, again, you can clearly make out something in the middle of all those lights. And I, I do not believe that it's all the lights forming one object that's matrixing in our minds no there is something solid in that sure looks that way and that's not a doctored photo either that's the original photograph yeah because that was the one that uh was in the newspaper the next day so something happened <laughs> i'm not gonna say it was aliens <laughs> but it was aliens I I, I I was I I needed the perfect final slide, <laughs> yes. and I I I had to do it. When I first because I, I I didn't I don't watch I've never watched an episode of this guy's show. The first time I saw that image, I thought it was David Arquette. It kind of does look <laughs> like David Arquette. And let's face it, David Arquette is crazy enough to have that hairstyle. And he's just crazy in general, I think. Yes, and again, you know. It speaks out to how popular that show was that you just need to see that image. You know, they always say you can't hear a meme. Well, in this case, I can. <laughs> I hear it. I'm not saying it was aliens, but uh, what's your cre what's your uh, opinion of the whole concept of ancient aliens in general? When we have so many different structures built across the world that are Hard to explain when you think about, again, you see the the pyramids behind him and you think about Stonehenge and you think about the Easter Island monoliths. None of those make sense as far as what kind of technology was available at the time that they were supposedly built. I, I Again, I'm not going to say it was aliens. But I'm also not going to say it was aliens. I, I think there's just too many things that have been built without technology being present. Because, uh, again, you think about a pyramid. It's not just the shape of it. Think about how secure that has to be to actually be able to walk into it. Plus, it, they've withstood how many years? Yeah. Think about the Sphinx and all of that. There's obviously something that because if we were to build a sandcastle right now, a week later, it's not standing. Nope. I don't care how secure it is. That sandcastle is coming down from wind and rain and other possible factors. So for all of these structures to still be standing, I've been to Stonehenge. There is a one of the giant bricks or whatever outside of Stonehenge where they give you the opportunity to see how heavy it is, to see if you could pull it. You cannot pull it. Trust me, I tried. I actually have a picture of me trying to pull just one of those structures. And it did not budge. Yes. So, I mean, so. you've got to... 
you just got to think about it. And again, like 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 you said, we're not saying it was, but we're not saying it wasn't either. You just because again, it it comes down to like what you said, having an open mind. And sometimes, you know what? And I know some of the stuff sounds crazy, but sometimes it might just be crazy enough to be true. Yeah. You just never know anymore, especially, you know, in the world that we're living in now, anything is a possibility. Sure is. Well, thank you for joining me on this slideshow adventure. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, This was awesome. I, I, I look forward to doing more like this. I don't care what the topic is. I am game for anything. Excellent. If you guys enjoyed listening to Jeff on the show or watching his reactions to the slideshow, you can check him out on our CKCC radio podcasting channel available wherever you get your favorite podcasts, including iTunes, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. He has two shows available, releasing every other week. He'll get a new episode of either Real Paranormal Talk, where he talks about All things paranormal, including several topics we just saw on the slideshow. And his other show, Ranking Tracks, where he takes famous albums and breaks them down from best, or from worst, to best on that album. Including a recent episode I did with him where we ranked Linkin Park's Hybrid Theory. And an upcoming episode that might even be out by the time some of you guys see this, where he will be joined by our other co-host, Dan Peck, to review Boston by Boston. Actually, that's because next week is the next ranking tracks. This week is going to be a real paranormal. Well, there you go. You guys subscribe now on CKCC Radio on Podbean or wherever you get your podcasts. You guys can check out that and all the other great shows. And, of course, Jeff's books are available on Amazon. And you have uh, several books available there. Yep. Like we said, there are six books. There are the uh, Paranormal Contact series. Three uh, is a trilogy. There's Everything Comes Full Circle, there's Time Traveler's Journal, and then there's The Object of My Obsession. So there you go. You've got plenty more to check out. Jeff, thank you very much. I look forward to having you back. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. I enjoyed every slide. If you guys enjoy this show, make sure that you subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get those notifications. I always love saying that. And we'll see you guys next time for another Slideshow Show. Have a good one, everybody.